Hello. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Friedman and I work for Clarinet. Mm. And before I start, I'd like to see a show of hands uh, for people uh, who were here at Link 72 and watched Patrick Gilmore's presentation given on behalf of ISOC about World IPv6 Day. That's reasonably good. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so this presentation uh, concerns uh, what you should be doing as an access network for World IPv6 Day. And I originally gave this presentation at the last UK NOF in Leeds. Um, and this is another version of it given uh, at the RIPE meeting, which I gave with a number of other people, uh, at including uh, it followed the ISOC, official ISOC presentation. So uh, I'm just going to start uh, with a, what if I can start at all? Yes, good. With a small uh, table of operators. And before I go into this table, uh, I'd just like to reiterate the important point that World IPv6 Day is not about turning on IPv6. It's not to uh, test uh, whether you can deliver IPv6 to end users. It's, to, it's for content providers to enable IPv6 support on their sites. And then for you to see whether your end users, whether they have IPv6 from you or from somebody else through some form of transition mechanism, will have any problems with it if it ever were to be switched on permanently as a technology for these large sites. So to go into more detail about types of operators that will end up uh, passing IPv6 traffic on the day, there's really three classes. Uh, the first class uh, is an operator with production quality generally available IPv6. Uh, the second type of operator has got some IPv6 deployed, perhaps as a trial or there's some limited support available. And then the third type of operator, as far as they're aware, has no IPv6 deployed at all. Uh, and then their users are, uh, have IPv6 connectivity through any number of transition mechanisms made available to them. And then there's Japan, which are so out of scope that if you really want to know more about them, come and ask me about it afterwards. So, World IPv6 Day, where does it occur in our region? Well, it's a working day and it's from uh, 0, 0100 hours until 2359 UTC. So, as you can see, uh, if you look at the uh, RIPE service, NCC service region, uh, the countries in it are roughly around the UTC mark, give or take daylight savings time. So, the course of World IPv6 Day very much follows a day in our region. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is about your company. If you're an access provider, is what's your user mix? Are you mainly residential? Are you mainly business or both? And what will your users care about during the day? And what will their day look like? And how will they experience their brokenness? So if you think about the, the, the journey of an average day of uh, a citizen of the United Kingdom, uh, they'll, as an internet user, what's the average person going to do when they get up in the morning? It's a work day, right? World IPv6 day is a Wednesday, so they're going to get up and they may use the internet from a smartphone, uh, but ultimately they're going to go to work. And then they're going to spend most of their day at work and then they may go to the pub. But ultimately they'll come home and when they come home there'll be a few short hours for which they'll have to detect any problems and then what are they going to do? So to illustrate this in a more general context, when I presented this at the RIPE, um, I, I actually uh, had to give the example of my mother and, uh, and what my mother would do if she suddenly noticed that things were broken. She'd probably call me. That's what would happen. But uh, let's just assume that when she got back from work and things were broken, she called me and I, and I ignored her. So what would she do next? She'd probably reboot the router. So she'd spend some time doing that and then realising that because it doesn't do anything, the next thing that she's been taught to do is run an antivirus scan. So perhaps she spends another hour running that and now it's close to her bedtime, so sort of defeated, she heads to bed. And that's it. Gone. She wakes up in the morning, everything works again, and I get a call saying, David, was the internet broken yesterday? <laughs> but this is it. I mean, Google's her homepage. If... Google doesn't load for her straight away. As far as she's concerned, the internet's broken. And is she going to call someone? What's she going to do? 
You know, nine times out of ten, she doesn't have to call somebody. She's been taught how to do basic troubleshooting. She knows to restart the computer, to reboot the router, to do the scan. She's been through all of this before when there's been a problem, and that sort of stuff has solved it. When is she going to realise that the problem, um, she needs to get somebody on the phone? And then what time of the evening? And are you going to have a support desk open? And if so, what are they going to do? So how will they be broken? What types of brokenness are we going to see? Well, there's really two main types. Uh, we divide those into what we call fake connectivity and bad connectivity. And fake connectivity is where uh, you get an IPv6 address from something that doesn't actually have IPv6 routing. Um, and then when you get the quad A from the site that's presenting it, you, you, uh, you try and connect to it. And of course, you can't because it has no connectivity. And then you need to wait for it to time out. And that's so the page hangs. And then you've got the bad connectivity. Where assuming uh, you've got some connectivity and you, you follow, you make a TCP connection to the, to the V6 address at the end of the quad A, then that connectivity is bad because you've got some bad tunneling or the tunnel's filtered or it's rate limited or, you know, there's MTU issues on it. And then you, you'll get an inconsistent experience. You'll get maybe a page load, but some of the images are broken. But ultimately, the overall experience you get is that, is that there's breakage. So how do you remedy this? Well, there are a number of ways, and I'd like to start with the most important one, which is to do with documentation and process, which I'll come on to in a minute. So documentation, having, having this well documented, because when you get these calls, you, you're going to need something to refer to. People are going to need to know in your organisation that this is occurring. People are going to need to know outside of your organisation that this is occurring, specifically your customers. If you don't have a process written and documented for the day, what are you going to do? How are you going to approach these calls? How are you going to distinguish between all the different types of brokenness and what you need to do to support the user if you end up supporting the user at all? And with that documentation also comes publicity. The more you can publicise this internally, the less escalations you'll end up getting during the day when people don't know what to do. And the more you publicise it externally, the less calls you'll actually end up getting because users would have checked themselves and they would have fixed themselves and done everything that they could as to not have a problem for the day. But let's just assume that uh, we're talking about end users that don't receive the publicity from you or decide not to do anything about it or think it doesn't apply to them or don't understand it. Well, you can pick these users out if you've got uh, flow data that you collect, be it NetFlow, or SFlow, JFlow, you can skim through it and you can look for some of this tunnel traffic. You can find Protocol 41, you can find the UDP packets created by Torito. You can identify who these customers are. Perhaps you could do some more targeted mail shots or calls to them if you really want. Also, if they're going to be using tunnels, uh, they're going to be using relays. And unless you're running the relays yourselves, which you know, only uh, really helps you in, in for one direction of the traffic with 6 to 4, for example, which is the outbound, uh, then uh, you'll find that this traffic gets relayed through all sorts of places in the world. Have you trace routed to one of these Anycast addresses? I think there's perhaps one or two relays in the UK. And, uh, and I think uh, one of the Lynx members here runs them. And I think you find if you trace it to the Anycast address, most of your traffic will, will be going to his relay. So uh, perhaps best to find out where that traffic's going to be going on the day. Talking about support, uh, if you know you're going to get these calls in the day, uh, a triage process is really important. Uh, and in fact, you can use your PBX to help you. And I'll show you this on the next slide. I've got an example process flow. If you uh, ring fence some members of, uh, of your support team for the day and you triage uh, World V6 Day faults into this team, uh, this team are going to be at the forefront of the knowledge and, and of the complaints and hopefully are going to be able to take the user through the process relatively rapidly uh, and keep your uh, support uh, desk free to get on with its normal day-to-day -day work. And finally, uh, collating uh, vendor knowledge base articles, screenshots, procedures, how to upgrade, how to disable tunneling support. There's this uh, great Microsoft knowledge base article that, uh, that contains uh, this Fixit uh, service, which is basically an executable uh, that you can click on from the, from the knowledge base article that gets downloaded to the user's computer and that actually makes the registry changes on their Windows machine or on your behalf so that you don't have to get them to go and fiddle around with a number of different controls. And this is directly linked to from the knowledge base article. You can, you can click on disable IPv6 tunneling support and it, it downloads the executable and off it goes. So I thought I'd give you a... a a flowchart that we're going to be using uh, for the support process on the day. And the way it starts is before the day, we're going to start with uh, music on hold. So at the moment, when users call in, uh, they get a recorded message and they get some music saying, yeah, welcome to Clarnet, uh, 
please wait while we take you to a menu system or whatever it is that happens. And uh, a few days or maybe weeks before the day, we're going to start injecting uh, a message into this music on hold saying that this day is coming up and uh, be prepared for it and visit our website for more information. And then on the day, the music on hold is going to change to um, telling people that if you're having any problems today, this is like the cause of it, and uh, you'll be able to select an item from the go to the website to get more information if you can. Uh, the website will be set up so that users won't have problems accessing it in order to get the information. But importantly, when they get through to the IVR, they'll be able to press a number straight away to get straight through to the triage team, uh, to be triaged to go straight through to the V6 day team if that's actually the issue. Uh, so the message will say something along the lines of, if you're having problems today accessing popular websites uh, and, and this, uh, this is new to you or this is just happening today, then it may be a problem with World V6 Day. Press 1 uh, to speak to a team who might be able to help you. And then they'll get transferred to this team. Um, and similarly, any other support calls uh, that come into normal team that triaged out can be triaged back in uh, when they're identified as V6 Day problems. So they'll be pushed to this particular team. And then we'll take people through the troubleshooting process. Use testipv6.com, what does it say? Uh, use ipv4.google.com, what does it do? Um, and then the general process will be upgrade your operating system browser, upgrade your uh, DSL router if need be, because possibly it's using settings which are old, which encourage tunneling when they shouldn't, or perhaps it's a, a DNS preference issue. Uh, and then finally, if we're not able to solve the problem, uh, we're going to advise them to disable the uh, V6 transition mechanisms and not the V6 itself, because that would be counterproductive later on when they actually formally request V6 from us. Uh, and this will be done through, for instance, the Microsoft Knowledge Base article, which they can just they can click on the Fix It icon, and it would disable the tunnels and make the registry changes and disable the tunnels for them. So to summarise, um, don't bury your head in the sand. As an access provider, regardless of your size or how IPv6 mature you are, your users are likely to have issues. And have a plan, uh, because having a plan is better than not having a plan. And tell your users in advance and have them prepared. Have them mark the date in their diaries. Have them check themselves, because this will mean less calls for you on the day. And don't forget about your dependents. Don't forget about the people that depend on your services, for example, resellers. They may run their own support desks, but depend on your infrastructure. How are you going to help their support desks help their customers? Are you going to expect them to punt all of the customer calls to you? Help them out, because they'll really appreciate this. And uh, it's unlikely you can sit back and relax. So since I gave this presentation, uh, one of the large names that are participating in V6 Day uh, trialled uh, quietly the technology and had their own V6 hour. And uh, whilst they should remain nameless, I can say that they didn't experience any problems. Uh, they didn't have an unusual amount of user complaints, and they didn't see anything which suggested that there would be serious problems when they went for the day. Well, the question slide's gone missing, so if you have any questions, now's the time to ask. I'll take that as a no. Thank you very much. <laughs>